Alrighty, what up, what up, what up? This is section 15.5 of the uh, chemistry textbook. We're going to be talking about applications of equilibrium constants today. Okay, kind of a short section, which is, I guess, good and, and bad at the same time. Uh, but uh, not not much here really to really to go on. Other than that, we're simply going to be talking about how we can apply uh, equilibrium constants uh, and then uh, uh, use them. Okay, so our objectives for today: we're going to talk about what a, the capital Q is, what's called the reaction quotient, and then we're going to know. Uh, we're going to uh, calculate some equilibrium based on the value of KEQ. Okay, well, what can we find out from KEQ? We have heard that we know that if KEQ is greater than 1, that we have more products than we do reactants. Um, and if we know that KEQ is less than 1, then the reaction lies to the left, and we've got more reactant. What we can also do is we can also use KEQ to calculate the concentrations of the reactants and the products when the equilibrium has already been reached. And then we know KEQ also allows to predict the direction in which a reaction projection will proceed to achieve equilibrium. So the third one is what we're going to talk about today. We've already talked about that first bullet there. We've already talked about when KEQ is greater than 1 or less than 1. We've also used KEQ to do this. But number th this third bullet here we have not talked about quite yet. Okay, so how do you predict the direction of a reaction? The way that you do that is you use what's called the reaction quotient. The reaction quotient is the capital letter Q. And it is exactly the same as KEQ in that it's products over reactants. You use the coefficients from the balanced equation. You do not include solids or liquids. It's exactly the same as KEQ. Except for if you think about an ice table. In an ice table, you've got the initial concentrations, you've got the change in the concentrations, and then you've got the equilibrium concentrations. When, you do, when you're figuring out KEQ, you certainly use the equilibrium values to determine the value for KEQ. Well, the reaction quotient is the same thing, but like it says here, it is the value that's obtained when you use the initial concentrations of the reactants and products in the equilibrium expression. So to solve for Q, you use the same equilibrium expression, but you use the initial values, not the equilibrium values. Now, what does it tell us? Well, if the value for Q is equal to KEQ, then you're already at equilibrium. Nothing has to change for the reaction to occur. Okay, here's the important part. If the initial value of the equilibrium constant, which again is Q, so if Q is greater than that of the equilibrium value, the reaction will proceed from right to left, from the product side to the reactant side. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about why that happens here in just a second. Okay, so if Q is greater than KEQ, the reaction forms reactants. It, it proceeds to the left. And then obviously if Q is less than KEQ, the reaction proceeds from left to right, which means it's going to form the products, not the reactants. Okay, so let's look at what, what that means. Okay, if Q is equal to KEQ, where we are at equilibrium, nothing else has to change here. Okay, if we look at this case here to the left, if Q is less than KEQ, Q must get bigger to reach KEQ, as you can tell from this graph. For Q to reach, if Q is smaller than KEQ, to reach KEQ, it must increase. For Q to increase, think, think again of what Q is. Q is the concentration or the pressures of the products over the reactants. So if you've got the products on top and the reactants on the bottom, for Q to get bigger, the numerator or the top part must increase and the bottom part must decrease. So therefore your numerator increases, the numerator again is your products, 
and your numer your denominator, excuse me, must decrease, which is your reactants. So therefore, the reactants are going down, the products are going up. And you think about what that happens in a chemical reaction, the products going up, the reactants going down, you know that the reaction is proceeding to the right. So therefore, when Q is less than KEQ, if Q is less than KEQ, the reaction must form products because Q must become greater to reach KEQ. Okay, and then looking at it from the other point of view, it's just the opposite. If Q is greater than KEQ, then Q must get smaller to reach KEQ. For Q to get smaller, again, the products are on the top. Those are going to have to go down. Just to make to make a fraction smaller, the numerator has to decrease and the, the denominator has to increase. For that to happen, the reaction must proceed to the left. Okay, so you can't really think about it in in terms of just a forward reaction. Remember, with equilibrium, you've got two reactions going: the forward and the backwards one. So when Q is greater than Q, Q must get smaller to reach KEQ, and therefore the reaction is going to form reactants. It's going to proceed to the left. So an example of a, of a question like that is they might give you a, 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 a reaction. They might say, they'll give you some initial concentrations, and they'll give you KQ, and they'll say, explain why when you put BaCl2 in water, or you put barium ions and chlorine ions in water, that then you have these concentrations, why it doesn't form any solid. Because for the reaction, for the, that reaction to occur, you would have to have, let me see if I can do this here. Uh, uh, uh. You would have to, the reaction would be BA, oh, that's ugly, huh? sorry about that, Cl2 in equilibrium with BA2 plus plus 2 Cl minuses. Okay, so if you put some Ba Ba2 plus and some Cl minus in a reaction or in in a in a solution, and that they say you know mathematically show why no BaCl2 occurs. Well, BaCl2 is a solid, so for some BaCl2 to occur, the reaction would have to proceed from the right to the left. So given the concentrations they would give you. Uh, basically, what you would find is that you would find that Q would be less than KEQ. For Q to pr for when Q is less than KEQ, we know that the reaction is not going to proceed to the left; it's going to proceed to the right, and therefore no BaCl2 would be formed from that reaction. Only the Ba2 plus and the Cl minus would stay in the solution. And sorry about the handwriting. I mean, trying to write on a computer. Come on. Okay, so here's an example of this where you've got a mixture of hydrogen, a mixture of nitrogen, and a mixture of ammonia placed in a container. They want to know, will the nitrogen and hydrogen react to form more ammonia, or will the, will the ammonia decompose to form more nitrogen and hydrogen? And the KEQ for that reaction is 2.79 times 10 to the minus fifth. Okay, so we use the values that were given. We hear our initial amount of moles. Okay, so to solve this, we've got our balanced equation. The for uh, Q, we know that Q is equal to the pressure of ammonia squared. Here's our product right here, over the pressure of nitrogen to the first power. There's no number here, and then the pressure of hydrogen cubed because we've got that three uh, right there. Okay, so we we place our values in here. Notice that these are pressures. Uh, we have moles, we have our volume, and we have our temperature. Don't forget to change your temperature to Kelvin. And then we just use the ideal gas equation, PV equals NRT. We solve for pressure and put those numbers in. Okay, so here's we find the pressure for each one of those three using, like I said, the ideal gas equation. Again, notice our units. We've got moles over moles. Here's our liters, atmospheres over Kelvin mole. Our liters over liters. Our Kelvin over Kelvin. Notice that our only unit that's left 
is our atmospheres, and that's why our answer is in atmospheres. Um, and then we use those values, our pressure of ammonia on top, there's our NH3, and that's squared. 61.2 is our nitrogen, and then our hydrogen is cubed. And we get a Q value of 1.34 times 10 to the minus fourth. Now what's important about that is we look at this number right here, the 1.34 times 10 to the minus fourth, then we go back to our KEQ value, which was 2.79 times 10 to the negative fifth. Now this number here isn't as important as this number right here. Okay, That times 10 to the minus fifth, if we compare that to our other value, which was 10 to the minus fourth, we know right away, totally disregarding this number here altogether, that 10 to the minus fifth is smaller than times 10 to the minus fourth. So we know that Q is greater than KEQ. So again, let's think about what that means. That means that for Q, oh man, that's ugly, sorry. For Q to reach KEQ, Q is going to have to get smaller. For this here to get smaller, this number here on the top has to also, this number has to decrease and these numbers on the bottom have to increase. For that to occur, what's going to happen in our balanced equation? In which direction is our reaction going to proceed? If the products are going down, these, this is our product, and our reactants are going up, and coming back to our equation, if our products are going to go down and our reactants are going to go up, then we know that the reaction is proceeding in this direction to the left. Okay, so again, like I just said, here it is in words. Since this number, since Q is greater than our value for KEQ, Q has to decrease to reach KEQ, causing the pressure of NH3 to decrease. So this one's going to decrease again and the, the reactants are going to increase, which means the reaction is going to form the reactants. So the reaction is going to proceed in the left direction towards the reactants. Okay, here's another example of this. It's not on your sheet. You might want to record this in some way. So we've got a reaction here, 448 degrees Celsius. We've got the equilibrium constant is equal to 51. That's the important one we're going to have to look at at the end. They want us to predict how the reaction will proceed to reach equilibrium at 448 degrees Celsius if we start with these amounts of each gas. Very similar to what the other problem. In this case it's iodine not nitrogen and we're forming hydrogen iodide gas from hydrogen and iodine gas. So again, we need to find the initial pressures of each of those gases. So we're, again, we're going to use PV equals NRT. We're going to use, if we start with HI, we're going to, those are our moles of HI. Here's our temperature. Again, change that to Kelvin. And here's our pressure. So we use those three pieces of data. We use the gas constant, the pressure of HI equal to 0.592. For hydrogen, we had one times 10 to the minus second moles of hydrogen. So we find that that's half that amount. And then the iodine should be one and a half times the amount of HI because it's three. And that's what we find. Okay, using those three values for our initial pressures, we put that into our value for Q. Again, for Q, we're going to have HI, the pressure of HI squared because of that two and then over the pressure of hydrogen and iodine and our value for Q comes out to be 1.3. So in this case Q is equal to 1.3 KEQ is equal to 51 so that means that Q is less than KEQ so for Q to reach KEQ it must increase. For Q to increase again our, our expression is going to be the pressure of HI squared over the pressure of H2 times I2. So for Q to increase to reach KEQ, this must go up, these two must go down, 
therefore the reaction these are going down the products are going up therefore our reaction is proceeding to the right like that big arrow I made there that's nice huh? really nice okay so here it is again in words if Q is less than KQ the partial pressure of HI must increase we already said that H2 and I2 must decrease so the reaction again is proceeding from left to right Okay, so just to sum up, the reaction quotient again is the letter Q. You use the same equilibrium equation. You put it into the equation. You just use the initial values instead of the equilibrium values. And then when we do know that, we know that we can use that equation to determine whether the reaction is going to proceed to the right or proceed to the left. Okay, we do have a few questions regarding that, so we will look at that. Uh, tomorrow in class. Again, if you have any questions, please record those so we have them uh, available when we want to use them uh, in class tomorrow. Thanks for watching and uh, sleep good tonight, huh?